I disagree a lot with Western labels and diagnosis. I'm going to tell you straight up. Um, a lot of the things that they call anxiety and depression, I mean, they give it these names and labels, but all I know that anxiety and depression is, is people being able to feel the grief, the anger, the bitterness, and the pain in the consciousness field. And they don't know how to integrate it. They think it's theirs, but it's not theirs. And I, I, I can tell you every spiritually gifted person that I know goes through some kind of anxiety and depression at some time or another. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Shifting Dimensions. I'm your host, Jumi Moses, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Paula Herlock. Paula is a wisdom keeper and ascension coach. She's also the convener of Wellness Experience Jamaica. Paula, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Yes, I'm so excited to speak with you. Before we even got started, I told you that, you know, you're one of the people that I've been kind of stalking for a while, <laughs> watching your YouTube videos, because you have so much wisdom, um, especially as it pertains to the awakening that we're all experiencing today. And I've been itching and hoping to have you on the show. So this is a big deal for me. Um I wanted to start off by asking you, have you always been drawn to spiritual and metaphysical concepts? It, that is such a, an interesting question. I've always been drawn to cosmic, metaphysical, anything that was not taught in school or church, I was drawn to. And it's now that I'm older and I'm understanding the awakening and past lives and soul missions that I can understand why I'm like that because obviously I came with a mission. So I was preloaded with that kind of predisposition, right? I was always interested in, in astrology, the stars, the planets, um, I was always interested in the earth. I was always interested in rocks and crystals. So every single thing that I've been interested in is tied right back into what I'm doing now. And it is really interesting to see that I've always been like this. Yes. And that's why I wanted to start off asking the question, because I feel like whenever someone is extremely passionate about something and they make it their life's mission. It, it seems like you're dedicated to this work. It's always fascinating to know, or I always have the suspicion that it started from a really young age. So you were you indoctrinated into any sort of religious programming? Because I'm like you, where I was interested in all of these things, but I was kind of indoctrinated into religious programming. So I was scared to talk about these things. Well, listen, of course, like most people in Jamaica, because I'm from Jamaica, I live in Kingston, Jamaica now. I was born in Montego Bay, Jamaica. I grew up in a Christian home. I went to Roman Catholic high school. I lived in a convent for two years. And luckily, my father was always a wild card. So he was reading the back, the the. the, the back, Magda Vita, but when I was young, he was reading um, the Kabbalah. He was reading about um, the Rastafarian faith. He was reading Marcus Garvey. So I had both happening simultaneously. And thankfully, my parents didn't force me into church. I went because of school and um, home, but I was not forced. So I was able to balance both. And so while I was at school learning about the Bible, I was also reading the hidden books of the Bible because I wanted to see why they were hidden. In fact, I was more interested in the hidden books of the Bible than the Bible because there must be something hidden in that 
why they took the vote. So that's the kind of mind that I've always had. I've always questioned everything. And I really am glad that I had the father that I had. Now, interestingly, it wasn't until my father passed away in 2019. And it was not until he passed away in 2019 and the pandemic in 2020 that I actually was brave enough to literally come out of the closet and say, I don't accept all of what organized religion is pushing. I have many Christian friends. I have many friends that are you know, pastoral, that are ministers. And literally a few of them begged me not to do this. Really? Yes. And I, I actually hesitated for a while. But then as the pandemic progressed, I was seeing so much more of how the programming impacted how humanity processed the pandemic that I realized that I had to start speaking out just gently, not to ruffle any feathers, but to help people to understand that their suspicion about organized religion is well-founded. Yes, and it's so interesting. Many of the people that came to me for one-on-one -on -one sessions came to me because they were so conflicted mm. with what they had been indoctrinated into and what they were now reading about. And I was able to help them to transition without feeling too much guilt and showing them it's okay. They can actually walk hand in hand until you know exactly what you want to do because life and learning is an ongoing process it doesn't end on the 25th or the 23rd you can say well you know i'm healed and i'm 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 filled with wisdom it doesn't work like that it's an ongoing process so don't don't be too hard on yourself yeah because you're always evolving uh first of all i just want to say that there's something about the pandemic that I think gave people the courage to kind of step into what their soul was calling them to do. And then the second thing is this idea of kind of being in the spiritual closet, because I think a lot of people are in the spiritual closet and they have a lot of friends who are deeply indoctrinated into religion, right? So it's fascinating that your friends begged you not to do it, which I also find that interesting. I'm sure that, again, added to the conflict within you, should I come out with my full chest and say these things or should I keep it within myself? Are you still friends with those people? or You know, I'm friends with most of them. I've done it very respectfully. They're just silent and we have respectfully chosen our paths. So they're very clear on what my path is. I've not, I'm, I've not been disrespectful because I'm not really disrespectful about people's choices. People are here on a journey of self uh, evolution. Yeah. And so you have to take your path. So I allow them to. What I do have a problem with though is when truths come out and people are so indoctrinated that they go into cognitive dissonance and refuse to acknowledge that that reality has just revealed itself. Listen, this is it. I'm sticking to my guns. I don't care what has come out. I don't care about the scandals in this church or the scandals here or how many dead baby babies were dug up from underneath this church or that church or what this priest or what that minister did. I don't care. I'm sticking to this. This is what I learned. This is it. That's kind of the painful part because that is the reason why we're unable to move beyond some of the problems that we have globally because people are holding to the indoctrination. 
whichever indoctrination it it may be. Yeah. And so we're not able to come together and say, you know what? We're going to change this because this is not right. So they would rather to hold on to their indoctrination and the wrongness of what the purveyors of that indoctrination are doing than to say, you know what? The truth is, this is not right. And if those are the fruits of this thing that I have chosen, then something is wrong with this thing that I've chosen. Yeah, That's not the reasoning, but that should be the reason. So that is why everybody's holding their ground. That is why there's so much conflict. That's why there's so much polarization. I think polarization is the main divisive tactic that is being used by the powers that were. It's working still, but it's about to end. And I want to talk about that very yeah. shortly. Um, but just to answer or just to kind of talk about what you just spoke about, I 100% agree. I'm like you, I, I've questioned everything, right? And I keep my mind open. But I think sometimes as human beings, we need a sense of safety. And I think yes. when you're indoctrinated into a certain belief system, it creates some sort of safety net for you. So when you start to cover, discover things that challenge what you consider to be your reality, it's very upsetting for people. And, and I think it's upsetting because people put themselves in a narrow box and yes. are too afraid to veer or, you know, open their mind to other things. So I agree with you. Speaking about the awakening, right, and the the powers that were, which is, I think that was intentional how you did that. So I want to talk about the great awakening. So I want to read something quickly that mm -hmm. I pulled from you. You said humanity is going through a mass awakening related to the stellar radiance hitting the earth as it traverses the photon belt. The extra light from these other stars affects the Earth's magnetic field and that of humans as well. Our DNA bodies and realities are being upgraded to higher frequencies and it can be uncomfortable. So I want to know from, from you what the great awakening, awakening is and why you feel as a collective species we're being upgraded to higher frequencies at this time. Well, it seems, and you know, I pull, I draw from a lot of different people and then I all, and then I kind of amalgamate all of that and I share based on my interpretation, my observation and my intuition about this. Yeah. So this great awakening, earth apparently is a school. Our life is a whole lesson. That's why they call it life lessons. So from your born until the day you die, the lesson is in progress. Yeah. So we're here on this, I think it's a school planet and we're here learning. And part of our, um, uh, part of, of the contract that we made when we came on was to be part of this awakening. So in particular now, the generations that are on the planet right now, the baby boomer generation X, generation Y, the millennials, everybody, we're all here at this time to go through this period of transition, this great awakening. All of the different uh, indigenous groups of this planet, all societies, all religious groups, all of them have acknowledged that this time was coming. Everybody knows this time is coming. It's been written about 2,000, 6,000 years ago. And we are, great, are lucky enough to be actually in the time when it's happening. And we know it's happening because all of these stories and historical accounts have detailed the different signs that we would see 
when the awakening or this transitional period would be taking place, right? So we, there are stories of our DNAs being, you know, messed with in the past, disconnecting us from divine source. And they've always spoken about the time when this DNA would be reactivated and we would become, you know, the whole beings, the, 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 the activated or the elevated human beings, you know, um, they call us homo sapiens now, humans, and they've always speaking of something called the homo luminous, which is the, the light bodied man, right? That's what they're saying we're evolving to. So everything about this time and our presence within this photon belt is speaking to activation. We see also that our star, which is the sun, um, is also flaring. And every time the sun flares, our earth is hit with high uh, uh, concentrations of photon photonic light, high speed photonic um, waves, and our electromagnetic field is being distorted, affected. That's happening to the planet, but it's also happening to us on the micro level, at the individual level. So every time the sun flares, our electromagnetic field is being affected. Our heart is being affected. Our brain, our entire central nervous system is being affected. And if our entire central nervous system is being affected by the pulsing light, it's being excited. And because our central nervous system, our brain and our central nervous system is being excited, all our nerves are being excited. All our organs are being excited, activated, and therefore all our cells. And even at a more granular level, granular level our DNA. So even though we can't see it, uh, we can't measure it. Although I think the science exists right now to measure the changes and the upgrades in our DNA, we know that is happening. We also know that humans are actually beginning to feel the effects of the solar flares, for example. Whenever there are lots of uh, solar flares, X-class solar flares, the sensitive people are even more sensitive. People get headaches, people have dizzy spells, ringing in the air, some people run a low grade, grade fever, some people are cranky, some people have weird dreams, some people can't sleep because they're running so much energy. The, there's so much energy running through their central nervous system. So now that most of us know what's happening, we're able to feel because now I don't remember 20 years ago being able to know when the, the solar flares were happening. But now everything on our feed is showing us when the flares are happening. And we can correlate that to how we felt last night and how we feel today. So now sensitive people are paying attention and sensitive people are recognizing that they're sensitive. So it's a beautiful thing that is happening. A lot of people are having their gifts amplified during these solar flares. A lot of people have had their gifts amplified since the pandemic. Why? Because the pandemic allowed us to go home, stay at home, be separated from each other. But what it also did, which nobody is wanting to acknowledge, is that it made us more potent versions of ourselves because we were not diluted by the energies of a whole entire workplace, a whole entire building going into work. We weren't, our energies, our auric field, our bioenergy field wasn't being distorted or, or, or 
interrupted by going on a subway, going in mass transport, being being stuck in traffic, being stuck in airports. So we were able to start to feel ourselves, hear ourselves, hear our thoughts. Some people struggled with that. They call that mental illness. But a lot of us melded and integrated those aspects of ourselves. And that's why since the pandemic, there are so many people realizing that they have spiritual gifts. So when I think about the pandemic, I actually think it was very beneficial to have that contrast, that, that, that busyness being halted and for everyone to stop and actually have the time to feel themselves, to hear their thoughts, to feel their thoughts and to sit with themselves. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree. There was, you know, a month before the pandemic, I was in an Uber with, mm -hmm. you know, me and my driver were talking and both of us felt like there was something in the air the atmosphere yeah. that felt different there was different. it was the energy was so potent I mean I didn't know the pandemic was coming yes um but there was something that was so potent about it so I agree with you there was something about the dynamic that made everyone pause yes. on their regular day-to-day -day life because we're all in the rat race we're just go 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 we don't have yeah. time to think Thanks. about our passion or kind of sit with ourselves and be in relationship with ourselves and yes. you know question things so it was very beneficial for the collective and I still think I still think the after effects is still showing up from the, yeah. the pandemic yeah. so you know speaking about the awakening right so we talked about that on a collective level on mm -hmm. an individual level you know we hear that word a lot in the spiritual community I had a spiritual awakening what does that really mean? Is that something we trigger ourselves or is that something that just happens? I think that's that that whole term spiritual awakening is very subjective. Um, I've spoken to people who have said, you know, they were sitting in their living room doing their meditation one day and they just felt this electrifying energy running up their spine and running down their spine and then it exploded and it, and they were euphoric. And I'm like, man, I wish I had that experience. Um, other people describe, you know, a moment when they left their bodies and they traveled into another dimension and it was so beautiful and they met their angels and they met their maker. And I'm like, I wish I had one of those experiences. So many different people have different experiences. Some people have had tragic and traumatic things happen. And that is what triggered their away. Some people had such ter terrible pain and loss that made them question why that was their way some people were hurt so badly by something that happened in their life um whether it was professionally related personally related you know loss of a loved one and that's what triggered their awakening so awakenings are very subjective right um i cannot tell you when my awakening took place, because I was like this for a long time, but I had to go through something that I perceived to be painful for me to um, come into that questioning myself, right? So yeah, that is a very personal thing, your, your awakening. Yeah. So is so my understanding is awakenings are when you start to shift from the old paradigm that you were used to or is that oversimplified right like if someone was talking to you and you were going to give signs that you, they might be going through an awakening 
what would those signs be for them? Right. Okay. That's, that's, that's an easier um, question for me to pinpoint. Um, I would say usually an awaken starts with some kind of pain or loss or tragedy or hurt. I always tell people that awakening for most people starts with the breaking of the heart. When the heart is broken open, it's to pour out love and also to receive love. That the heart was probably not able to give out or receive before. That's what that's one of the common denominators of awakening, some sort of heartbreak. I don't know of very many people who just had a perfect life and then one day they just got up and awakened. Every person that I've spoken to that went through the awakening went through a dark night of the soul in preparation for the awakening. In fact, their awakening was triggered by a dark night of the soul. Everybody, very few. There are some people who were born, you know, as masters and their gifts were recognized from birth and they were taken by their mentor from childhood. And perhaps most of those persons didn't have to go through an awakening because they were they were aware of their soul purpose. But most people I know had to go through a dark night of the soul, right? So that's number one, the dark night of the soul. Two, the, the self-healing. And a lot of people were drawn to different books, texts, courses, teachers, modalities to help them to navigate that pain caused by the dark night of the soul. So some people decided, hey, I need to meditate to get my mind off this, to still my mind, to calm myself. Oh, I need to go to yoga. That will help to relax me from all this stress. Oh, I need to... Um, start to journal i need to start to do walks i need to start hiking i need to to go on a retreat yeah so first the dark night of the soul then the self-healing and as i said before most of the people who are self-healing they do a lot of reading around the different topics they do a lot of shadow work to help them navigate all this pain that they're feeling yeah and then um and then after the healing comes the recognition that i'm different now than i was before and the acceptance that um a new phase of my life has started and this is what i have to do to maintain this aspect um, of me to maintain the balance that keeps me happy and grounded and balanced as a human. Um, a lot of people, when they are going through the awakening, their lives have changed. Their friends may change. Their circles may change. A lot of situations and people will fall away. And for a little while, you are left alone, you feel very alone, you feel very isolated, but that isolation is a part of the process of awakening. And most people experience that isolation, right? So that's three, three so far. One, the pain, you know, the tragedy, the dark night of the soul. Two, the self-healing. Uh, three, the isolation. And then four, when they recognize who they are, how they're connected to divine source, and that they have a role to play. 
one of the things that I've seen that's pretty consistent with awakening is that the persons who are awakening typically fit a profile, you know, black sheep of the family, fringe operator. They operate on the fringe of their friend group. They operate on the fringe at the office. They operate at the fringe in society. Yeah. Why? Because they've never fit in. They've never seen the world quite like everybody else sees the world. Why? Because most people who are awakening now were always different. They always had spiritual gifts that were, were latent. And it's not until they have the dark night of the soul that some of those latent gifts start to surface. And so they start to see the world in a different way. They start to hear more than the average person. They start to see more than the average person. They start to feel more than the average person. They're able to perceive so much more when they walk into a room than the average person. And so when they see fake people, when they see pretentious situations, when they see hypocritical scenarios, they're like, I don't want to be a part of that. And so they shy away from those things. So that's another thing that happens with um, the awakening. You're able to see so much clearly that you start to be a little bit more discerning about persons, places, and things and activities that you partake in. Yeah. And I think those are the main ones um, that I, I would mention uh, right now in terms of the awakening. But definitely one of the biggest ones is that black sheep of the family, the one that is misunderstood, the one that doesn't fit in, that doesn't blend in, that just stands out. Why? Because they inherently have a problem with the current structures of society, the current structure in the workplace, the current structure of the family they don't accept the current situation in the family whereas others accept it zip it and just go through they're like no i don't like this either they say something about it or they act out and so they stick out in the family as the difficult one mm -hmm. or the misunderstood one or the outcast straight up you know, it's so interesting. I think everything you said was spot on because as you were talking, I was thinking about myself mm -hmm. and the part about the dark night of the soul. It, you're like slammed into it and you have this moment of reckoning where you realize that you've been, if your path is right, you've been trying to force yourself to go left. Yes. And you're at this crossroads where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to try to figure out the right path instead of staying on the left, right? And it's this intensive work. But I've also realized that sometimes when people experience heartbreak, they don't go on the right path. They could end up de-awakening. I don't even know if that's a word, like the opposite of awakening. Ultimately, because some people just, just take a very long time. Yeah. But I'm telling you, that heartbreak thing, it works. Mm -hmm. Now, some people go into a negative spiral and mm -hmm. continue down, right? But most people wake up and change course as a result of the heartbreak. Now, one, one thing that I'm going to say might come across as being a little harsh a little insensitive but everybody has their path to go on and even our friends our family members our loved ones that choose a path that we are not in agreement with it's their path they have to go that 
that that journey. They have to, some people choose to go through intense, recurrent pain to be able to get to evolve. And some people self-destruct and leave and come back again to start the process. And we just have to respect everyone's journey. And this brings me to this whole subject of death. In the Western cultures, we fear death, we misunderstand death, and we fight when death comes to one of our, you know, comes knocking on the door of one of our family members through disease or old age. But when you understand that death is as a result of you having completed your mission, whether your family agrees or not, your mission has been completed and it's time for you to transition to your next, um, next assignment. And people have to realize that death is not just a transition. Death is meant to send a ripple through the lives of other people that have been left behind because death can be a catalyst for someone else's awakening because sometimes life is just wonderful it's going fine and everything is perfect and you had a perfect childhood and your mom and dad are this and that, and then your mom dies and your whole world turns upside down and it's the first time that you've had to sit down and think about life and in, in existential matters. So it has its purpose. And so this is why we have to allow people to do what it is they want to do, even if we disagree with it, even if we think it's a downward spiral, even if we think it's the wrong choice. We can warn them. We can tell them that this might be the consequence, the outcome. But we also have to just recognize that that's their journey. It is simply their journey. You understand? Yes. Thank you for actually bringing up that piece of things because part of the reason I'm so into this work and passionate about this work is from a very young age, I've had this fear of mortality and mm -hmm. I didn't feel like religion was doing a good job of explaining what we're really working with in this physical reality mm -hmm. so part of my interest in these topics is because I'm trying to understand the nature of reality how death works what it means for people who because love is one of the highest vibrations right so yes. to love something and to lose it but if we understand how things work we can transmute that yes. love yes. into something good right yes. and it's not a loss right it's just a, a um a catalyst. change yes, yes a catalyst yes, yes exactly so thank you yes. so much for bringing that up and you know speaking about awakening and having going through heartbreak when people when people awaken awaken one of the things they think about is like okay well I'll be free from any sort of depression or anxiety or heart issues but we know that sometimes a lot of times awakening brings up a lot of discomfort and when you think you've awakened you might still experience an imbalance, right? So anxiety, depression, panic attacks. Why is this? And 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 why is it okay to still feel these things even after going through an awakening? Right. So I, I, I'm going to say this. I disagree a lot with Western labels and diagnosis. I'm going to tell you straight up. Um, a lot of the things that they call anxiety and depression, I mean, they give it these names and labels, but all I know that anxiety and depression is, is people being able to feel the grief, the anger, the bitterness, and the pain in the consciousness field. 
and they don't know how to integrate it. They think it's theirs, but it's not theirs. And I, I, I can tell you every spiritually gifted person that I know goes through some kind of anxiety and depression at some time or another. And it's pretty regular because most of the people that are having anxiety and depression now more than ever are empaths. And so when we dumb down our feelings by medicating, all that we're doing is repressing all those spiritually gifted people and giving them a label and telling them, oh, you suffer depression. You have to be on this medication for the rest of your life. So there's less powerful people around. Right? So why, it, why is it that so many people got anxiety and depression during the pandemic and since the pandemic? It's because of the awakening. Where they're able to feel more, to see more, to hear more, to see through different realities into other dimensions makes them feel crazy makes them look crazy and when they go and sit down with someone who doesn't understand because they don't have those same gifts then they'll just go into their textbook and tick 10 boxes and say right you have all 10 of the characteristics of this particular such um uh, condition, so therefore you have this condition. And guess what? What's trending now is that everybody accepts these diagnoses lock, stock, and barrel. Right? Me, I don't. And especially, um, I have found because I'm in Jamaica, and my population is mostly people of color. I swear, everybody in Jamaica has spiritual gifts. They feel, they know, they're clear, they're clear cogniz cognizant, they know, they see, a lot of them see, but they don't tell you they see. They have the gift, powerful gift of, 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 of they, you know, they call them prayer warriors, but it's people whose throat chakras are so well developed that they can speak things into reality. Yeah? So my observation is that this widespread mental health problem that we're having all over the world is the awakening is the people coming into awareness of their spiritual gifts and it's just uncomfortable because nobody speaks about it at school and suddenly you're hearing voices in your head and everybody tells you that if you're hearing voices in your head you're not while some people are calling it, oh, I'm channeling, oh, I downloaded. Mm. Other people are being told they're nuts. So it all depends on the kind of conditioning that you've had. Yeah. Yes. And how open and receptive the people around you are. I was told by my family that I needed to go and be psychi psychiatrically analyzed because they thought I was nuts. And I said, listen, you can waste your money and send me to the psychiatrist. I will just run circles around the psychiatrist and leave, and he will say I'm okay. Yeah, but they thought I was nuts. Yeah. And if I had complied with them and gone, I would have been labeled bipolar and put on medication for the rest of my life. Mm. And here I am. Yeah, it's it's so. <sighs> I just love that you just said that because I agree with you. I think a lot of mental health issues have energetic and spiritual roots that people don't want to dig deeper into or understand. Either yeah. you're labeled as crazy or you're labeled as a demon is inside of you, right? And yeah. when you hear that, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? That's why I think it makes, it exacerbates these situations because people are like, oh my God, I have anxiety. I have, 
you know, I have, I hear voices in my head, all of these different things, but we're spiritual beings having a human experience and people have different gifts. Like you said, some people will say hearing voices, you're channeling, right? And if yeah. you know what you're dealing with, then you're no longer afraid. You're not giving yeah. into the fear consciousness. You can yeah. manage it. You can control it. Are there situations sometimes where I know that sometimes what we eat can give us more anxiety and stuff like that, but this is, yeah. we're not talking about that. We're talking about things outside of, you know, typical stressors or things that might cause anxiety. So I, I absolutely love that you said that. And it kind of, I think is a, it's a great segue to something that you've talked about often, which is observing, but not absorbing. Right. So like you said, there's so many things going on in this world. And you said that people who are very empathetic and have you know, they're more tapped into their spiritual gifts, feel things on a higher level. And they might be feeling the collective sadness and think it's theirs, right? Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about observing and not absorbing? Listen, that is such an important topic right now, especially as we have all these global conflicts. I cannot tell you the number of persons that have reached out to me in tears, in pain about what's going on in Palestine. And I'm like, listen, you cannot take on what is happening there. Number one, some of what is happening there is contrived and is specifically designed to get you into this state of fear, sadness, grief, and helplessness so that your energy, the collective energy of outrage, sadness, anger, bitterness can be harvested by the powers that work because we are providing fuel with those emotions. And people don't understand. Polarization also creates a similar thing. Everybody's looking at the US election and people are furious and irrational about the person that they want to vote for. It's crazy. And so it's important for us to maintain some level of neutrality around all of what's happening and focus on the outcome that we want, which is why one of the things that I've been trying to promote is getting people to start to think about heaven on earth. It's possible. It, it's kind of a stretch to know that there's conflicts in Palestine, conflicts in Sudan, conflicts in, in Congo, conflicts in um, Haiti, and then to go straight from there to heaven on earth. But we, through our thoughts, through our focus and attention, create the collective reality for earth. And if most of us are focused on the conflicts, what's going to happen? Where attention goes, energy grows. Yep. So when we when we paid attention to the war, we just gave it more fuel. Remember right after the pandemic, we started talking about monkeypox. Yes. Remember, do you know what happened? Everybody was like, listen, we're outside now. <laughs> we're not even interested. We're not going back inside. We don't care. And monkeypox died. It died because we it didn't take hold. It didn't create fear within us and we didn't give it any attention. Yes. I, you so know they create the war and everybody's like a war is this world war three does this is this what this means ah uh, could this be happening now okay and and then they they put the media the media narrative into motion and every channel is talking about the war and the conflicts and da 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 and everybody's watching it and everybody's angry and everybody's like why can't they stop it and the, but i'm i'm Always caution everyone, remain neutral, stay away from polarization, 
because polarization is what they use to keep us from unifying. Yes. You know, some people listening to this might say, if I stay neutral, then that means I don't care. How am I helping the cause for it to be better? I don't listen to them because there is a little bit of neurotic behavior in some people. And I've watched it unfold on social media where people are like, if you're not taking a side, you are the problem. And I'm like, yeah, whether I take the side or not, it doesn't matter. Mm. It's unfolding, right? They, they focus on that to distract you from the root cause of the war, which is the financial and economic benefits to a particular country. Because through the sales of arms. Yeah? And so many other layers. So instead of focusing on the root causes, they're attacking each other and fighting with each other on social media. So now it becomes a part of the narrative. Oh, you're a prominent person and you didn't use your platform to take a side. Well, then you must be a supporter of the bad guys. I just ignore everyone. Right, mm -hmm. because a lot of this is still very disingenuous to me because there's a lot of conflicts going on all over the world, and yet only some are in the news, only some are really a big problem, only mm -hmm. some children are worthy of our tears being shed. Mm. I just watch everything. And I'm neutral because I see the hypocrisy. I see some levels of disregard for some races. I see it all very clearly. And I just don't allow it to bother me. Right? It doesn't mean that I'm a mean-spirited, evil person. Because I know that with every soul that leaves, they leave so that they can come back at a higher vibration to assist the ascension process for Earth. So a lot of souls are choosing to leave now so that they come in, come in with the higher vibration. Because imagine people born in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s came in to a denser... Uh, a denser time than people who are being born now in this high vibration right they're able to achieve much more in their lifetime so I don't grieve death and in the same way that other people grieve death mass deaths in my opinion are a sign because Matter cannot be created or destroyed. So the same numbers that are leaving are the same numbers coming in. Mm. If people don't interfere, which they've sort of interfered, which is very interesting. I hear that the birth rates globally have fallen. And we know why. Why? It's by design. Well, look at all of the um, initiatives birth control, abortions that have been proliferating globally over the years. And even the pandemic has, and I'm going to use quotations here, in some ways contributed to the diminished birth rates globally. Mm -hmm. But then there are other groups of people who have a very robust birth rates yeah so we do know that souls leaving is part of the plan because they're coming right back higher vibration to help to midwife earth into new earth into the golden age yeah yeah so again observing but not absorbing. So observe what is taking place, but do not absorb the pain 
do not absorb the polarization, do not absorb the rage that this situations have been designed to make you feel this way so that your energy can be harvested. So when you remain neutral, you just observe with intelligence, you keep yourself in a state of love and light, send love and light to every situation, you pray for the lives that are being, for the souls that are, you know, transitioning, you pray for their safe transitioning, and you know that they're coming back to aid in the ascension process. Speaking of ascension, we've talked about the powers that were, right? Which again, I, I like the were part because that's on purpose that you're doing yes. that. Yeah, so yeah. I've heard a lot of people talk about heaven on earth. And I think yes. what everybody's trying to say is that we're moving towards a new earth. And people have said that there are two earths that we're moving towards, right? Mm -hmm. One is more like heaven on earth. The other one is more of a low vibrational frequency full, filled with war, polarization, and hate, yeah. right? Yeah. So yes. two things come to my mind. Is this a physical split off? Is this an energetic split off? And could you talk a little bit more about the ascension process towards a, a new earth, the heaven on earth that you've alluded to? Right. Beautiful question. So we're talking about the two timelines, the new world order and new earth, right? Two different concepts. One is kind of heaven on earth. The other one is darkness, control, manipulation, transhumanism, et cetera, et cetera. Now, What's going to happen or what is happening is that those two worlds right now are merged or fused together. And so depending on your choices and how you raise your vibration, you're going to find, and the decisions you make, you're going to find yourself in one or the other. So if you are very, very careful about what you eat, if you are very, very careful about what you consume mentally, emotionally, spiritually, if you are very careful around the tribe that you surround yourself with, the things that you choose to spend your time doing, your passions, the things you love, going into nature, you will find that you're going to create a different reality for yourself. If you, on the other hand, are about, hey, I want, I am for implants and, um, you know, AI and um, I am all about digital currency and crypto and technology and this and that, and then you're going that way. But what's going to happen is that they're going to be existing simultaneously in 3D but people by their choices will find themselves in different situations. So they're going to be coexisting. I'm going to give you an example of how these two worlds can be coexisting at the same time based on choice. During the pandemic, I said, nope, I'm not taking um, what they're prescribing. I'm going to get myself healthy and strong build my immune system, eat healthy, exercise, and spend a lot of time in nature, right? On my, in my neighborhood, there are approximately 10 houses and different people on, in that neighborhood took different decisions. And I ended up with a group of friends who said, listen, if we're going to be on lockdown this weekend, because in Jamaica, we had four days of lockdown, you can't move anywhere. So what we decided we would do would go to a resort and spend those four days of lockdown. And so when everybody else was tortured, staying at home and feeling very miserable about staying at home, we were enjoying the beaches and the rivers and a resort. And so we had just a series of beautiful experiences going to the river, 
going out into nature, camping out and hanging out together, eating very well and so on. Other people were so afraid, they were masked up. They didn't want to interact with anybody because that person could be carrying the disease and da da da. da. So they were living inner hell and outer hell, and we were living heaven on earth. Then in a few months, a whole lot of people in their world started to die. And, and they were going to funerals every week. And I'm like, huh? How come none of my friends are dying? And none of my friends' friends and none of my friends' friends' family. So what you see is happening right there in this little microcosm. I was in heaven. And some people were experiencing hell. They were seeing the deaths. They were seeing the hospitalization. One of my neighbors said she had four co-workers in hospital at one time. And she had three funerals that weekend. And I never went to one funeral for the whole time. So what's going to happen with the New World Order and New Earth is that they're going to exist in pretty much the same realm but people will be having different experiences altogether. And I will still be able to interact with the people who have chosen the new world order. And I'll be interacting and observing the people who have chosen new earth. And we're gonna be having totally different experiences based on the choices that we've made. And it seems like like it all starts from the mind. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Because remember, we are the architects of our reality. Mm. So this is why, for example, you know, I think a lot about, you know, the African continent. I think a lot about Haiti. And I mean, looking at why they haven't in 30 or 40 or 50 years been able to stabilize in that country and it's because the people have been subjected to so much trauma and distrust and uh, and betrayal over the years that they cannot conceive of a life or a country where they have a trustworthy leader and they can trust the people that are around them and so it really all begins in the mind. So you have a country that has a collective of people that don't believe that they can do anything else but suffer. That also is happening in those parts of the African continent where the colonization was very brutal and evil and oppressive. Those people's spirits have been broken. They don't know what it's like to not suffer. So perhaps some of the mass deaths that we see associated with those conditions is so that those souls can leave and come back into situations that are more uplifting for them or they come back in a situation where they will be the ones who effect the change in those parts of the world because they vaguely remember going through a lifetime of pain and suffering. And they know when they come into this lifetime that they have to ensure that they destroy the pain and suffering. So it's very interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting what you're saying, and I agree with you. And and part of what you're saying makes me think about this whole notion of victim consciousness. And when people talk about victim consciousness, they think, oh, if you say that you don't want to be a victim, that you're negating the pain and trauma groups of people or individuals have had to go through. But that's not necessarily what we're saying. Victim consciousness gives you the power to shift your mind that's and it. choose a different reality. That's do you want to stay a victim and be victimized or do you want to transcend that, um, transcend those experiences? And it starts with the mind. And I can let you speak a little bit more on that. I'm sure you can articulate that better than I can. No, you did it beautifully. It's very, very interesting. Um, 
you know, I live in Jamaica and I tell you something, Jamaicans are a very interesting lot. Jamaicans cannot be fooled. They cannot be fooled. They are going to see through a situation. You can fool them for a while. You can fool them once, you can fool them twice, but you're never going to fool them the third time, right? And I traveled to the African continent. I, I, I entered um, on the east. So I went into Tanzania. Then I went into um, Uganda. Then I went up into Egypt. And what I realized is that it's such a, last, a, a vast continent that people are just getting on with their life. You know, I'm digging my fields. I'm filling my sacks to put on the truck to send to the market so I can get money, so I can feed my children. They have no idea of what kind of uh, manipulation and control is being exerted on their reality and by whom. Whereas us in Jamaica, we are very aware of what is happening globally, nationally, internationally, and how it affects us. And so that's why Jamaicans are militant and we're like yeah we see what's happening don't try that here it's only some africans are able to see and articulate what is happening the average african has no idea of what is happening and why he is in so much pain and why his economy is like that um some of them have a clue they'll say oh it's corrupt corrupt um, leaders, but they don't know why the leaders are corrupt and they don't know what external forces are being exerted on their leaders. So it's very difficult to get uh, a collective shift in consciousness of people who really and honestly, genuinely don't have a clue as to what is happening and therefore how they should shift their perspective. The same thing is happening, for example, in North America, where there are 150 million people and 125 have no clue what is happening because they're able to get food, water, um, clothes, a roof over their head so they don't know what's happening they don't care about what's happening anywhere else except in their country and they have no idea that they need to hold their leaders accountable for some of the atrocities that are happening in the rest of the world they have no idea so it's just one of those things where it is necessary for us to have the awake so that more people are able to see through the illusions of what is happening. And because they're able to see their actions and their response to certain external stimuli will be founded upon or predicated upon what they know of what is happening. Mm. You know, speaking of ascension and awakening on an individual level and being open and like having your eyes open to what's going on around you and what's keeping certain groups of people or individuals oppressed, I always think about outside of questioning everything, could following a path of authenticity also kind of get you to awaken? And I know that's an interesting question, right? Because there's something you talk about, which is following the golden path, yes. right? So mm -hmm. I, I want to know, because I've, I've talked to a couple of different people and they say that one of the greatest vibrations that you can align yourself with is, authenticity. is authenticity. And I want to know if more people align themselves to their authentic nature and follow the golden path, could that also give way to some level of awakening or ascension on an individual and potentially um, global level? You know, that's such an interesting question. Um, the golden path 
the way I describe it, it's really for those people who are searching and they want to know, you know, what should I be doing? What should I do next? Where should I go? How can I move from point A to point B, right? But, for, but what happens to those people who aren't even at the level where they can think existentially? They just know that they have to dig those vegetables. They have to pile them into that 25 bags and they need to pack them on that truck at 4 a.m. And so they're not thinking about, who am I? What am I doing here? How can I contribute to the collective consciousness and the ascension process? Yeah? But I think when you're doing the right thing, you also open the door very fast. And when I say the right thing, for a simple person who has who's living in a simple village and they have five children, you know, a husband and a wife and they have five children. And this, just the simple act of providing for their children and making the home a happy place and ensuring that their children get education and know what is right from what is wrong, that opens the golden pathway and their children are blessed and their homes are blessed and it's a beautiful thing yeah so that's how i would answer that question in terms of you know the golden path opening to the people who are searching yeah um when you're providing for your home and your family your wife or your husband and your children you are authentic you're filled with love you're filled with care and you're filled with nurturing. That is also authenticity. So I want to ensure that everybody knows that they have access to authenticity in their lives. Yeah, mm. it's not just doing what you want, it's doing the right thing as well and feeling the joy while you're doing it and not feeling like, you know, I don't want to be a slave to this husband or I don't want to be a slave to this wife you know and a lot of that is happening in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I, am, I am very unnerved when I hear you know little snippets of, of women speaking about their marriages and women speaking about relationships and men speaking about relationships it's unnerving you know to listen but again it's choices, people have to make choices. We're gonna lose a lot of people to immorality. We're gonna lose a lot of people to addiction. We're gonna lose a lot of people to crime. We're gonna lose a lot of people to poor choices. But there is a group of people that are very aware of their purpose, aware of their soul mission, and that small but critical mass of people are going to be the ones that will be able to shift into the new earth, into the ascended um, state uh, of, of existence for humanity. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. And, you know, as you were talking, thinking about the golden path a little bit more, I feel like once you go down the golden path, which is when you're searching and you're trying to figure out what should I do, which, you know, where should I go, which is really and truly just allowing yourself to let your intuition guide you. Um, I feel like that's when you start to experience heaven on earth, right? So Absolutely. I feel like I've been going through a process where I've been following the golden path, right? When something feels like a hell yes in my soul, in my being, in my vibration, I don't question it. I just do it. I take the action. Once exactly. I get a download, once I get an intuitive hit and it's like, you know, someone asked me one day, they said, would you consider yourself a lucky person? And I was like, huh, that's a good question. I was like, I don't know if I would use the luck as the word to describe it, but I know that life is easy when I don't go against my current. When I'm in alignment with it, 
life is easy that's the external resistance is gone the internal resistance doesn't exist the exist the external resistance doesn't exist either you may make a very good point uh because people tend to push against the grain push against closed doors when if they were just still and choose the high road the one that gives them the most joy then they'll see that the golden path is revealed to them and so you know that's just one of the things that i really encourage people to do um do what you feel will give you the greatest joy greatest satisfaction um do what you know is right all the time and invariably it's going to turn out to be the right thing and it will always take you to the right place at the right time and this is why though it's very important that you maintain high vibration at all times it means that you have to spend a little time with yourself every day in silence listening to your inner conversation perhaps doing a little programming of your neural pathways into with positive affirmations eating the right um, foods natural foods that will ensure that your central nervous system is nourished making sure that you get out into nature making sure that you're breathing you're moving your body and you are cultivating your bioelectric field your aura your energy field cultivate that by meditation you cultivate that by being in nature you cultivate that by eating the right high frequency the bioavailable foods so it's not just oh go meditate and do yoga and you're home free if you're eating garbage you will not be home free because the foods especially the processed foods were designed to give our central nervous system a hit to give our gut a hit to distort the gut microbiome and mess up our digestion and therefore mess up what goes to our brain in terms of nourishment and by extension the 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 messages being conveyed from the brain to the organs via the central nervous system we have to be doing everything all at once so that the golden path becomes more visible to us because we actually feel our gut tells us that we should go left and not right or we should go straight ahead and not go back Mm. you know everything is connected everything is connected connected. the food is a part of it the food that we have now is not accidental it's very very carefully curated to make us unwell to make us dependent on certain um pharmaceuticals to make us not function as cognitive you know or cognitive function be diminished to make sure that we can't focus at work to make sure that we can't sleep properly to make sure that we're irritable and impatient with each other so many things yes i i spoke with this woman who she's um a a gut specialist and she was just talking about how you know the gut brain connection and how a lot of foods can cause people to be angry without any sort of explanation have deep depression a lot of brain fog so to your point about following the golden path right going down the path that your intuition is telling you to go down you also need to be able to hear your exactly. intuition and sometimes and if your gut is mm-hmm. messed up, you can't if your gut is messed up and you're depressed and you have brain fog you can't make a decision you can't see the path yes so but you know 
to your point, this food has been carefully curated. Even stuff that's supposed to be healthy, even the vegetables, even certain pressed juices, you read the, you you look at the content and you're like, this is, this has been genetically modified somehow, right? right? So it's like you're trying to race against whatever they're doing. But for for most people, they it's almost, at least in the Western world, in America in particular, it's almost, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's almost difficult to get. It's difficult. Or, it's yeah. difficult. And, and, you know, I, I encourage people to really listen to their intuition. Because a number of people told me personally, Paula, two years ago, spirit said move. And I relocated to Domrep, I relocated to Puerto Rico, I relocated to Costa Rica, I relocated to Ghana, to Tanzania. A lot of people got a nudge from spirit to move. Some people got a nudge from spirit to go off grid these nudges are real and those people have followed the nudge of spirit and they're off grid they're eating good food from the land that they grow yeah and they're going to be okay and the people who have not heeded that nudge they're going to be okay. It's just that it's very likely that they're going to be living in that new world order where they're going to be okay with artificial food, with artificial medication, with implants, sending their health information to a central database with thoughts being put into their brain. They're going to be okay with it. It's going to be comfortable for them. And then there's other people who will require real food and their soul has already pre-positioned them to be able to get access to real food and good clean water for their family. Mm. So it's, it's okay. Everything is going to balance out. Everything is going to balance out. When you follow the golden path, you know, you might, decide, okay, I, I'm not going off grid, but I'm going to take a job in Colorado. Or I'm going to take a job in Hawaii. Or I'm going to take a job in Central America. And that might just be the move that allows you to be able to get non-genetically modified food, fresh water, clean air, and um, safety when the time comes. Mm. So I just encourage everybody to listen deeply, observe carefully what's happening and know when it's time to shift your geographical location or to take a decision to move to a new uh, part of the country mm. because there are maps available with the safe zones oh, they, wow. already, they already know they already know where the safe zones are are going to be can it be googled can someone yeah. google it yeah just oh, go to okay. safe zones in in north america safe safe zones on the on planet earth so so um there's a guy edgar casey mm. the sleeping prophet type in ed type in when you google type in edgar casey um um world map and he shows you what coastal areas are going to be gone and what coastal and what areas are going to be intact and if you use that map it can guide you and you can say okay i'm going to shift a little so or i'm going to take that job posting um in that part of North America, I'm going to move my family, you know, and yeah. you can make those decisions. So I think it's very important for people to pay attention to everything. Don't just say, you know, that doesn't matter to me. Let me just keep my nose to the grind and work, 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 work. Stop. 
assess your environment, look at what's going on on the global economy, look at, at what's going on in terms of wars, look at what's going on in terms of the dollar, look what's going on in terms of gold and metals and natural resources, look at what's going on in terms of volatility in the stock market, look at what's going on in the weather pattern. Put all of those things together and be guided by those things as you look at your golden path. You know, if we go back to food for a second, right? Mm -hmm. Does fasting work? Because intuitively I've been guided to, because, you know, there, some people will say, if you feel like the food you're eating isn't nourishing your body, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Yeah. So, yes. or if you feel like what, you know, what you're eating is not harming your body, then that's like, you're not aligning yourself with that vibration. But what yes. something else that spirit has been, has told me recently is that, I mean, I don't have a science degree or anything, but there's this intu intuitive feeling of fasting, being able to, clean out your system and get rid of excess waste because yeah, yes because you know a lot of times we're told to continue to eat like three meals a day four meals a day but sometimes even if we might not be able to control everything that's in our food fasting might help to get rid of those excess things in our blood and in, in our gut that are not aligned with us so I just want to hear if if that could also Listen. be an option for people who cannot you get clearly, you are clearly listening to spirit our bodies don't need half as much food as we consume especially here in the west in in some of the most remote tribes those people have one meal a day and they 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 are hunter gatherers and they are fit flexible um strong and healthy we eat way too much food. And now, you know, we're following the science and we're taking supplements because, oh, the food is not nourishing us because there's so many contaminants in the air and, and we have to, to consume more antioxidants. Nonsense. I've done exactly the same thing that you are thinking about where I, I used to do a lot of green juices, right? Along with my fruits. And I noticed that when I've been having my green juices recently, my body doesn't feel as nourished as it used to. And I had a sneaking suspicion that they have distorted some of the vegetables that I juice. I'm wondering if they put, you know, they're saying that they are able to put the vaccine into um, pat choy, lettuce, cabbages. And so I felt like I'm not feeling as energized as I used to when I would green, make my green juice. So what I've done, I've just started fasting. And I'm not looking the worst for wear for fasting. I, in Jamaica, we can get heirloom fruits and vegetables, you know, from the countryside. And so we can eat fairly healthy and and not have too many toxins in. In Jamaica, we have access to the same processed foods as North America, but I choose not to go to the supermarket. I go to the market and I get my produce weekly, fresh fruits and vegetable, and I consume slow cooked meals. I cut it up, I cut up the onion, the garlic, the pepper, the ginger, the turmeric, I, I saute it in the frying pan with the vegetable and that's what I consume with some ground provision, with some green bananas. So I'm not eating too much rice, which I'm hearing that they're sending a lot of arsenic-laced rice to third world countries, right? I'm not eating pasta, which is double, <laughs> double dead starch because it's dead starch that's processed into even more dead starch. There's nothing wrong with pasta for some people. We were not, people of color are not supposed to have so much pasta. Italians can have pasta. They're living in the Mediterranean. They consume a certain amount of olive oil. 
and, and, and fresh tomatoes and dried tomatoes, everything works together. But when we here in the tropics consume that kind of thing, it doesn't serve us. So I would encourage everybody who is having doubts about food to choose nutrient dense, nutrient rich fruits and vegetables. Drink a lot of water that you have activated with some of those vegetables. Like if you want to make your dead water a little bit more alive, just cut up some cucumber in there, cut up some watermelon, cut up some lemon and reactivate the water so that when you drink it, it's more bioavailable. What's happening with the water is that they've stripped the water of all the minerals. So when you drink things, you think you're hydrating. All that's happening is that the water, which has no minerals, is stripping your minerals and pushing it out. And that's why people are still dehydrated, even though there are more water companies and there's more access to bottled water than there has ever been in our, in our history. That's by design as well. So it's best to get your water from fruits and vegetables, right? But fasting is amazing. And if you don't feel well, just fast. Drink your water, drink your juice, drink your tea. Why? Teas, depending on the herbs that you choose, will give you the necessary phytonutrients to nourish your body, to nourish your central nervous system, to cleanse and tonify your liver, kidney, um, lungs, uh, stomach, pancreas, all of those organs that are required to keep your body functioning. But the less food you have to process and the less toxins your body has to deal with and try to assimilate and, and, and get rid of is the better your body will function. So fasting is amazing and i encourage it i highly encourage it thank you for sharing that you know the fascinating thing about what you said is for different people depending on where they're from can yes. eat certain foods that work well for their body but yes. other people like maybe people of color might have a diet that's better for us so it's about kind of understanding your body body and I think getting a gut test if that's available to you could also help I also think intuitively when you eat certain things certain things I eat give me a headache so I know exactly. there's something wrong here other yeah. things I eat I can feel my body processing it quickly in a yeah. way that doesn't make me crash it energizes me so I'm like oh yeah. okay this works well for my body beans is yeah. one of those things for me but if someone's listening to this and they're feeling a bit overwhelmed, right? Because a lot of people are distrusting of the powers that be, right? People are questioning things. People are distrusting of the food. People are distrusting of the education system. I mean, the list goes on and on, right? Yeah. But yes. if someone's hearing this and they're feeling overwhelmed, the question I want to ask is, are we striving towards perfection in order to get to the new earth? Do we... Do we need to be like hypervigilant hyper -vigilant? or like, how do we balance I trying to do important. better? Mm -hmm. I think it's important a to find your tribe and to get comfortable with a support system or a, a, a set of mentors that you know and trust, right. To guide you along. Right. Um, I think the mindset and, and the reason why I say it's important to find a tribe because a tribe can hold a vision better than one person can. So if you have a tribe and you guys are all about eating the right food and um, doing the right things and participating in the right modalities, then it's going to be easier for you to make the right choices. For example, if I don't trust the fruits and I don't trust this and I don't trust that, I will still, I have no choice. I will still get go and get the frozen berries or the fresh berries when they are in season. I will still get the coriander and the um, parsley and the celery 
because even if they're genetically modified, they're still better for the body than some of the other processed foods that are available in packages. Yeah? The body will still recognize and process and integrate those things better. So in terms of the food, I still go and find my blueberries, my blackberries, my raspberries, my strawberries, and I'll still try to consume them and combine them with whatever I need to combine them with to keep my body fairly strong and fairly healthy, right? It's, a, it's very important to find the tribe because the tribe can build an egregore together. And so the egregore, let me explain what an egregore is. An egregore is a thought form that if people hold that thought form long enough, it manifests. So to give an example, the pandemic was a direct result of an egregore built by the media narrative that was pushing fear of a lethal disease. And so everybody believed it, everybody bought into it, and it happened. Yes. Yeah? So when you have a group, you build an egregore of safety, of well-being, of knowing that whatever happens, we're going to be okay and we have each other. And we're going to eat right. And we're going to strengthen our third eye. We're going to strengthen our intuition. We're going to strengthen our knowledge of uh, spirituality. We practice the things that will ensure that we are keeping a high vibration and that when there's a transition, we will transition into new earth. Mm. You know, again, that just ties back into the fact that we live in a mental universe and everything starts from the mind. And if you hold a vision in your mind, it does come mm -hmm. to pass. But when multiple people hold the same vision, it's that much more potent. So I, I think that makes sense. And this is just the, the final question I want to ask, speaking about a community. One mm -hmm. of the other things that people feel distrusting of is this man against woman narrative that's being pushed out so much and the breakdown of so many romantic relationships. Um, I just want to get your thoughts on, do you think that's part of the current oh. ascension? No, that's definitely a man-made situation. They have created that polarization. Remember I spoke about that polarization that is so widespread in so many different areas of our modern life. We have polarization in politics. We have polarization in ch churches, among the different religious groups, that polarization um, in terms of, you know, I, I, I consider them all agendas. So we have the LGBTQ situation and that's creating polarization um, and, you know, transgenderism, and you know transhumanism um you know abortion and not abortion um so many things now this thing with male and female that's not by accident there is an agenda from the early 60s 70s to break up homes right um to break down relationships because it's part of depopulation if you don't have people hooking up then how are you gonna have a, a a robust birth rate remember we were trying to trim the population by how many million yeah so it is by design and it is up to us to become conscious enough of how much we are buying into the narratives that are being spun and propagated through social media, through the music. Yeah? We have to become aware and decide that I'm not buying into that. That is not, that narrative is not going to affect me because I'm not buying into it. And if more of us became 
aware of what we accept as a narrative and do the right thing and be a good person, then we would attract other people, other like-minded people who have decided to dismiss the narratives and be a good person. And then you will have equally yoked couples getting together. You will have males that have decided that they're going to do the right thing, getting together with females who decide that they're going to do the right thing. I cannot tell you the number of little clips that have gone viral of women bashing men about, you know, I don't want any broke ass man and women um, bashing other women, and calling, you know, you know, niggas and hoes and, you know, oh, I am a liberated woman. I will not be preparing food for my husband. He has to prepare food for himself and, all sorts of narratives that are going viral. They go viral on purpose. They go viral on purpose. Remember the algorithms can push yes. whatever negativity out so that more people will see it and more people will attack the problem with righteous indignation about how dare her say that. Oh, I agree. This is it. We have to be hyper vigilant about what concepts we allow to come into our consciousness and be accepted by ourselves yes this whole thing oh i'm going on a first date and you have to carry me to a five-star restaurant you don't know me and women are saying yes i deserve it this whole thing about soft life and everything is gone all overboard everything is played it's overplayed you know, I have a young, I have a son that's a young man and I am terrified for him because the values that the current generation of young men and young women have leaves much to be desired. But it's like that by design. It is. And so we have to, as parents, talk to our children and show them that what they are seeing out there, they should be strong enough, strong minded enough, strong willed enough to know that that's not the path they will follow. I often say in Jamaica, we are parent pressured. In the US and North America, people young people are peer pressured so in jamaica we as parents have more influence over our children than other children now or the school in in the u.s it's the opposite so no matter how much you try to inculcate certain values into children the system is doing a better job of shaping their perceptions and their attitudes and their morals I, I, I can't have that. Mm. And I want to encourage people to ensure that they play a bigger role in shaping their child's perspective than society does. Mm. It is possible. Yeah. I'm not going to I'm not going to outsource my child rearing to a school, to a system that does not love my child and does not want my child to succeed. I'm going to give my child the tools that I know will give him the best possibility of succeeding in the world. That means I'm going to make my child highly suspicious of what they're told, highly suspicious of what they're taught, highly suspicious about what everybody else is doing. I gave my son very clear instructions. If you see the masses going that way, you go that way. Mm. That's a simple instruction. But it's going to be one of the guiding principles for him. And I know he uses it. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, I agree with you. Social media is a tool for manipulation. 
Instagram, there was this girl, she posted something about her first date. And it. yeah, it, it was terrible. But there's so many people have those posts, but I think she just posted about how the date went and how she was a little bit disappointed about something. And there were two, this couple was looking at the video and the girl was reading the comments and she was seeing comments about, forget him, he sucks, this, this, and that. And then she looks at her boyfriend's phone and she like opens the same post to read his comments and his comments were different from hers. It was all the men saying, look, she's so ungrateful. She's this. So she realized that, wait, even though we're looking at the same post, we're be it's being shown to us and it, the pushing. algorithm is pushing yes. different narratives of the same yes. posts, right? You're not really seeing neutral comments. You're seeing polarized comments. But I also think that social media serves as a simulation, again, of this heaven on earth thing that we've been talking about because my content, I have two pages. I have yes. one page where it's nothing but amazing quotes, people yes. with wholesome stories, right? Yes. Because my algorithm is configured to bring really that good is. stories to me. And yes. then there's another algorithm that brings all of the the junk, right? The polarizing information. So it's all very fascinating. So I, I like the breakdown of that and really teaching the next generation of the importance of questioning things and not going with the masses. I think what my guiding principle is anything that advocates for polarity without any sort of nuance or coming together or rectifying the situation or talking about understanding, I I always, that's a red flag for me. That's always a red flag. So I like how you broke that down. Thank you so much just for the wisdom that you've imparted on me and the audience today. It was an absolute pleasure speaking with you. To close out the show, because it's called Shifting Dimensions, I want to know if you shifted in perspective on anything recently. I shifted in perspective on something that's very controversial. I'm going to throw it out there because... I thought about whether I should bring this, verbalize this on social media or not, but I'm going to. Came up again in my walk this morning. I've noticed that there's this expression as people pray, you know, the prayer warriors, they say, you know, they call or they plead for the blood of Jesus. Um, you know, cover this situation in the blood of Jesus for resolution. And it suddenly hit me recently that 20 years ago, I never heard that terminology. And I'm hearing it every single day. And I'm also seeing that we are being covered with the blood of our young men and our children. And I wondered to myself, if that particular terminology wasn't inserted into our religious narrative because our throat chakra is so powerful, especially of, as people of color, that we are actually promoting more bloodshed in our people. That is a paradigm shift that hit me very recently. It's going to be controversial, but I know that 20 years ago, I never heard that expression. And now I'm hearing it every day. And now I'm also seeing so much bloodshed in my country, so much bloodshed all over the world. I cannot help but wonder if there's a correlation between that particular statement and what is going on in the world wow you know? wow that just blew my mind you know we talk about words as a form of casting spells right and it's interesting how we say things sometimes that we don't even know the power 
of what we're saying that, you know, people say there's power in the tongue. So it's, it's interesting that you got that download, you know, like it, that's mind blowing. Thank you for sharing that. I'm curious to see what the audience thinks. It's a bit controversial because, you know, because I got the download this morning on my walk and I mentioned it to someone and she was furious. And she says, you know, I'm sticking to what I've learned. And the Bible said this and the Bible said that. And I said to her, listen, you've seen so many scandals. You've seen hundreds of dead babies being found, you know, underneath churches and this and that. And nothing has budged the people that have been conditioned uh, into accepting these things. And I feel like I judge things based on the, the fruits. And if the fruits are bitter, if the fruits are unpleasant, then why would I continue to water the tree? You know, um, the other day, a couple of, of those super churches, the pastors or ministers were brought into disrepute and the people are steadfast. That's not changing anything. Let me put on my blinkers and continue. That's kind of one of the reasons why the world hasn't changed because people put on their blinkers and pretend that they're not seeing or they're not correlating to things. And, you know, it's going to be, it's, I don't think it's going to be well received what I just said. People are going to argue with it. And I'm going to say, who told you that? Who gave you that piece of information? I once had two very good friends of mine we all had dinner together. One is my Rastafarian friend and one is my pastor. Mm. Yeah. And I told my Rastafarian friend, you know, she's a pastor. Be very careful about what you say. And I told my pastor friend, you know, she's Rastafarian, so be careful. Anyway, the dinner uh, went through uneventfully and it was beautiful. And, you know, my friend said, you know, my Rasta friend said, you know, she mentioned this thing about being covered in the blood of Jesus. And she said to, she said to me, as a Rasta, I can think of nothing more demonic than being covered in the blood of a man. And I was like, wow. That's when it, it that's when she said it to me. But this morning is when it really hit me. And that's why I asked these questions, because I want to see what paradigm shifts people are, are having. People can agree, people can choose to disagree. You're not hurting anybody from your perspective. So thank you for sharing that. But I resonate with that because I've been having a similar line of thought, actually. Yes. 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 Thank it you. Has to, it yeah. has to be brought out. In, it, it has to be brought out. It's going to be uncomfortable. But deep down, people will think about it and perhaps they'll stop using the term Mm. a little yeah. bit more because now it's being reframed and they're like wait a minute what am I really praying saying. saying what am I saying you know and sometimes it's you have to ask yourself like who are you praying to because the God in the Bible sometimes is presented in a way that doesn't represent divine source to me so there's there's so many layers there I appreciate you so much for sharing this where can people find you if they want to hear more about your your work and just listen to more interviews and videos on subject matters that you've offered? Right. Well, I have my Instagram page, which is Paula Herlock. And I have Wellness Experience Jamaica also on Instagram. On my YouTube channel, which is Wellness Experience Jamaica, Paula Herlock. Um, I do drop videos occasionally, but the largest pool of videos from me are on I Never Knew TV. That's podcast. I Never Knew TV podcast. There's like, I would say over 40 videos there. Um, 
you know, where they ask questions and I answer them, you know. I also do one-on-one -on -one consultations for people who are having issues with ascension, with, you know, uh, uh, energy, helping them to navigate the different energetics. Um, so I can also, there's a link in my bio, so you can always schedule a one-on-one -on -one session with me and I can help. I'm not a therapist and I don't do therapy the conventional way where we do a session and then I schedule you for the next six months of therapy. I do one session with you and I shift the paradigm very quickly. It's all over. And if I think you need some follow-up, I refer you to another person who does, um, you know, uh, help, help with clearing trauma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. But yeah, that's where you find me on Instagram, on YouTube. And you can also book one-on-one -on -one sessions with me. Awesome. I'm going to leave all the links in the show notes. Again, Paula, thank you so much for stopping by the show. It's been an well, incredible honor speaking thanks. with you. And thank you for doing what you do. I think it's very important to have uh, a podcast of this nature that helps people to see um, the alternatives um, to the narratives that are being presented. Very, very important. So thank you for what you do.